Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Henry, um, for that introduction. Uh, thank you to the Prisoners of Conscience Fund for inviting me here, and as Sir Henry says, for the very constructive and positive relationship that we have at English Pen with the, the fund, which helps us as a, as a writer's organisation to support those writers in countries like Iran, Burma, China, Cuba, and elsewhere around the world where the freedom to write is far from taken for granted. Those countries seem to be becoming more and more, and the freedom to write, the freedom of speech, a value which many of us think of as an inalienable birthright, certainly in this country, something we're proud of to think of as part of our traditional liberties dating back 800 years, that freedom is far from something that we can be complacent about, even in this country, and certainly not in Iran. Um, Penn was founded here in London in 1921, but very rapidly grew into an international writers' association. There are now 144 centres in more than 100 countries around the world. There is an Iranian Penn centre, many of you may know of it, but it's not in Iran for obvious reasons. It has to be based in exile in Europe. And what links all of our members around the world, who are writers, publishers, agents, booksellers, journalists, others who are engaged professionally with literature, is this commitment to the universal value of freedom of speech. Now that universalism, that crucial universalism, is something which has been chipped away at consistently since the publication of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, where it was proclaimed as one of the highest aspirations of the common people. Freedom of speech is Article 19 of the Universal Declaration, but even in the preamble to that incredibly important text, it's defined as something. And this is in the wake of the Second World War, in the wake of the Holocaust, in the wake of the suppressions of the 1930s. And it was very obvious to the world community at that point, that without freedom of speech, none of those other abuses and grotesque violations of our fundamental rights can be prevented. And so in 1948, that mission seemed very clear, and there seemed to be universal support for the principle of freedom of speech. Now that picture has changed dramatically in the 60 years since that moment, and actually no greater change really has taken place than occurred in the crucial months which were discussed already in that very moving film. And I must uh, say thank you to Masood and Shokafe for being here today and, and, and giving us the chance to see that incredibly powerful, moving um, piece of work. But what was happening in that period in Iran has enormous significance, both for the people of Iran today, but also for the world community. Because what the Ayatollah did at that same time, partly, I think, in order to distract attention from the human rights violations which were taking place, but also in a perverse but strangely successful way to build support for the idea of censorship was to declare a fatwa, not against the people of Iran, not against dissidents within Iran who were protesting on the streets, but against a British Indian writer who in this month, 21 years ago, just as that um, um, uprising was taking place, published a book here in London, a book called The Satanic Verses, a book which, among many other things, is primarily a savage attack on Britain, not on Islam, not on Muhammad, not on core faiths, uh, core aspects of the Muslim faith, but actually on, on, on Thatcher's Britain and its immigration policies. Anyone who actually reads the book will see it. it's an indictment of this country. But it was this government that he attacked that was forced to spend millions of pounds of taxpayers' money protecting him. And he's still under real threats today because of that fatwa that was declared on February the 14th, 1989. A kind of Valentine's Day present of the strangest kind, or others have described it as the worst book review a writer ever received. The fatwa 
led to deaths. Rushdie, fortunately, is still with us, but his Japanese translator was killed, his Norwegian publisher was attacked. Many others died, actually, in the course of protests against the book in India and Pakistan. And in this country, um, the Muslim Association of Britain attempted to bring a case, a private case for prosecution, for blasphemy against Rushdie. It failed because at that time it was deemed that the blasphemy laws did not protect religions other than Christianity. In fact, it was established that the blasphemy laws only protect the Church of England. Um, several years later, the Labour government, in its wisdom, decided to change that situation to move towards a state where the feelings, the sensibilities of all religions were protected from so-called abuse or offence, and they drafted a Religious Hatred Act to that effect. Now at Penn, and at many other organisations, we felt that this act set a very, very dangerous precedent, because it actually seemed to give legislative force in the United Kingdom, in one of the homes of civil liberties, to the very principle that the Ayatollah embodied in his fatwa, to the principle that to offend someone's religious beliefs is a crime. And it was very clear that if the act in its original form had become law, that Salman Rushdie, other writers like Gurpreet Bhatti, who wrote a play about the Sikh religion in Britain, Monica Ali, who wrote a novel, Brick Lane, about the Bangladeshi community in Tower Hamlets, the authors of Jerry Springer, The Opera, a play which satirizes Christianity, any of these authors could potentially have faced prison sentences as a consequence of the offense that they would cause to members of those faiths. Now, in that respect, I feel that the, the fatwa, 15 years later, had almost borne fruit in the deepest way when Western liberal states were starting to enact the same kind of attitudes that were coming out of Iran as a response, as a distraction from what was happening at the end of the 1980s. The globalization of censorship really was starting to become a reality. Fortunately, we were able to campaign against that bill and to, 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 um, to secure some very important amendments to it, which limit the offence dramatically, make it very clear that, it, that an offence only takes place where someone actually incites violence. Anything else, however provocative, however offensive we may find it, we may wish to argue with it, we may wish not to listen to it, not to read it, but we don't lock writers up for what they say or write or what they believe. Nonetheless, something very important has changed. And I think what was most worrying was that many liberals in this country, in Canada, in the United States, elsewhere, to varying degrees, seemed to come out against Salman Rushdie and seemed to support the idea that free speech is not a universal value, that free speech is something which can be negotiated which perhaps you have to be on good behaviour. Perhaps free speech is a duty more than it is a right or a freedom, but you have to earn free speech by being a good citizen. Not that free speech is something which is there as the very oxygen of democracy, because it lets in air, because it allows people to say things which are shocking, which may be upsetting, but which can bring about change. Because I don't think that the people who benefit from censorship are the disempowered, or the voiceless, or the minorities, women, children, the old, the gay, these are not the beneficiaries of censorship. The people who benefit from censorship are the people who are in power, whether that's in Iran, in London, in America, in Zimbabwe, in Uzbekistan, in Moscow, in Mexico, wherever it may be. And the more that we collude in this reduction of the public sphere, and this reduction of what we define as free speech, I think the more dangerous waters we move into. So I feel absolutely in awe of the campaigners we saw in the film. I'm in awe of many of you here today who I know have campaigned, have paid the price, and continue to campaign on the front line for fundamental freedoms in Iran. And at Penn, we salute you and we stand with you as far as we can in that, in that battle. I just want to remind all of us that this battle is not confined to Iran, but that those events in 1988 and 1989 had far-reaching consequences for citizens all over the world. And we have to remember that free speech is a universal value, an inalienable right, not something which we earn, but something which we are born with and which we sacrifice at our peril. Thank you very much.